So I would like to take a moment to thank everybody for joining us today. Um, it's April 28th, and this is our Family Medicine Grand Rounds. And the event code, if you need it today, is 118047. That is the code for you to obtain your CME credit um, through the CME office. Their information is located there, and I'll also be putting it again in the chat box. So be on the lookout for that, but you'll want to make sure that you do register for that before midnight tonight. Um, so please make sure you do that. Next slide. And so for today, as we get started, please make sure um, that you do have your microphone on mute. And also if you would remain attentive and engaged in the session. And also I will be putting at the very end, I'll be um, putting the link for the evaluation for our speakers today. If you'll help us give feedback, we really do appreciate your help with that. Next slide. So this is the South Texas Regional Family Medicine Grand Rounds, and we'd like to welcome everybody. Um, we are partnered with the South Central Area Health Education Center, the South Central AHEC, and our mission statement is, is provided there for you. Next slide. If you are interested in CME transcripts, um, you can go to the CME's website and you can view your transcript there. I will let you know that if you ha are having any issues seeing any of the um, sessions showing up on your transcript, you may either reach out to myself or to the CME office. Um, their information is listed there, um, their phone number as well, but you're also more than welcome to send me an email or, or give me a phone call and I'm happy to help also. Next slide. You are also able to, if you are a member of the AAFP, you are able to um, uh, use the uh, one prescribed credit for this session. And if you have questions for them, please make sure that you do contact the AFP with the information provided there. Next slide. And so today, Dr. Ibarra Becerra and Dr. Nato have no, um, no relevant financial interest with commercial interest to disclose. So we are going to welcome and we appreciate everybody for joining us. We have a uh, current third year resident, Dr. Priscilla Ibarra Becerra, and also our residency program director, Dr. Mark Nato, and they're going to be discussing with us today, understanding migraine headaches. So I'll let them go ahead and take it away. Yes, I'm muted. I'm <laughs> so sorry. Uh, okay, so we're going to start with our objectives. Um, the main thing for this presentation is to describe the international classification of headache disorders. And we'll refer this as a ICHD, its importance in the care of headache patients. Uh, we'll also discuss the diagnosis and complications of migraine headaches and consider and apply migraine treatments. So we're going to start off by a case report. And this will be a question number one. Uh, try to remember this case report because this is the same patient that is going to be three uh, questions in, in through, the, through the presentation. So Annie, this is a 21-year-old female with a history of throbbing left hemicranial headaches once a month for at least two years, for the last two years. The headache lasts about one to two hours and are associated with nausea, vomiting, and aggravated by loud noises, loud noises and light. The symptoms are relieved by taking self-prescribed NSAIDs only when she has the headaches. She denies seeing any flashlights, zigzags, or sparks before or during her headaches. Also, she denies any other medical conditions that does not smoke, tobacco, or consumes any alcohol or stimulants or any other prescribed drugs. So what is the diagnosis? And we can use a chat box. Um, I'm not able to see that chat box. got one answer for B. B. Okay, B, yes. So migraine without aura. 
And it's important to know what kind of migraine our patient have uh, or has to be able to make a good diagnosis and a good treatment, right? So we'll go over the international classification of headache disorders. And this is a great um, way to describe them and diagnose them. So the first edition was done in 1988 and it was called cephalalgia. And it was based mostly on the expert opinion, which turned out that it was true. So they continued to do uh, 2004, the ICHD2, ICHD3. Uh, this is the beta version in 2013, which was just, uh, just you had to read a lot of stuff and it was not very easily um, described like the ICDH3 that was done in 2018. And I put the website here because it's very easy to go through it. It tells you how to use it. And this, you just click on it and it'll give you all the description on all the headaches um, and the different kinds of headaches. And if, we I can, yeah. if I can make the point here, this was a tremendous advance in the migraines. Uh, before 1988, if you look at articles about migraine headaches, you've got to really get into the methods and see exactly what kind of headaches they describe because it really varied from study to study. And um, so the, in 1988, they, uh, they got together and it was the, the most important thing they were trying to accomplish was to standardize the definition more for studies going forward. And over the years, this came to be used much more clinically. So I think it's very helpful. You can go through yourself. It's pretty explicit and figure out uh, just sort of going through the, the pick list, uh, the types of headaches. And then you can feel pretty assured that if you think somebody's got migraine, that somebody, some other uh, independent observer would come to a similar conclusion. Yes. And if you guys want to just click on that or look it up in your phone, it's super easy to use. Very, very user friendly. And it's split in three parts. Part one describes the primary headaches. Um, the headaches that are described here are the migraine, the tension type headache, the trigeminal autonomic cephalalgias, and other primary headaches. And we'll go a little bit over those. Uh, oh, well, I'm gonna focus more on migraine. I think there's Dr. Palacios who's gonna talk about tension headaches and other types of headaches. Uh, part two is uh, but the, yeah the secondary so the secondary headaches here um, there's a whole bunch of things and there's even more more lists uh, in the um, guideline there um, the uh, this talk we're going to focus mostly on the primary headaches the most common type of headache is the tension headache it's kind of a shared experience almost everybody's had that right um, and then the other two uh, the migraine is probably second most common and is fairly common and then uh, trigeminal uh, neurology is less common and other primary headaches is actually a pretty small piece of the, of the uh, number that you'll see. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Nito. So the part two secondary headaches are, include the ones that are head and or neck trauma, cranial or cervical vascular disorders, non-vascular intracranial disorders, su substance or its withdrawal, infection, disorder of homeostasis, headache of facial pain attributed to a disorder of the cranium, neck, eyes, ears, nose, sinuses, teeth, mouth, or other facial cervical structures. And we have uh, also attributed to psychiatric disorders. Part three focuses more on the neuropathies and facial pains and other headaches. So these are pain painful lesions of the cranial nerves and other facial pain and headache disorders. So um, the ICHD has all of these very, very self explanations uh, in detail that can help you diagnose any of these. So we're gonna start with the migraines. Uh, we know they could be very, very disabling to our patients. Um, sometimes they can start when they're pretty young, even in middle school and they suffer for migraines until they are in their teens and they, they can function. So basically this is a very debilitating 
they have the, the migraine and then the next day they feel very, very tired. So there's many epidemiologic studies that have been documented that decide prevalence, uh, socioeconomic and personal impacts. There's a global burden of disease in 2015. It was ranked the third highest cause of disabling disability in worldwide, both females and in males under the age of 50. And it's estimated annual US direct costs of migraine are more than 17 billion. And this is because of the cost of the loss of productivity and reduced quality of life, which are significantly higher. People cannot go to work, they, they stop functioning basically. So it's very um, important that we can treat and prevent them if they have them, you know, if they have chronic migraines. So this is a pound mnemonic, and I think it's super easy to remember mnemonic. So I decided to put it in here is a pulsatil. They can have one day of duration, which is four to 72 hours if untreated or successfully treated. It has to be unilateral. Uh, sometimes it's accompanied by nausea, vomiting like a patient, uh, disabling intensity they're not able to do stuff. Um, and then if they have four to five features of this mnemonic, the probability of migraine is 81% in females and 60% in males. So pretty good mnemonic to have. Um, so we're gonna talk about migraine without aura first. Uh, basically, it's important to know if, it, if it's without or with an aura, right? So the without the aura is the criteria is to have at least five attacks that fulfill this criteria, B through D. The headache attacks lasting four to 72 hours. Headaches have at least two of these following four characteristics. So the unilateral pulsating, moderate to severe pain intensity and aggravation by or causing avoidance of routine physical activity, walking, climbing of stairs. Um, during the headache, at least one of the following, also nausea or vomiting, photophobia or phonophobia like our patient had. And of course, not better accounted by any other ICHD3 diagnosis that could rule out a secondary headache. And the migraine with aura basically is the migraine with out our criteria plus these um, recurring attacks that last minutes and of unilateral fully reversible visual, sensory, or other central nervous system symptoms that usually develop gradually, um, followed by the headache. So these people have this kind of aura symptoms and then the headache comes. It's like telling them that the headache's coming, right? But some people even can have can have the aura with the headache. So this is the diagnostic criteria. So basically um, the aura criteria is a visual, the sensory speech or language, motor and brainstem or retinal. And these are pretty scary um, signs uh, and symptoms, right? So if somebody cannot speak or they have motor, they, don't, they have some kind of weakness, it's pretty scary, right? So they're almost always in their first time they end up in the emergency. And of course we have to rule out a stroke. Um, the diagnostic criteria has to be fully reversible to make sure that this was an aura, um, di uh, migraine with aura. And then criteria C is at least three of the following six characteristics. So at least one aura symptom spreads gradually over five minutes, more than five minutes. Two or more aura symptoms occur in, a, in succession. So for example, uh, patients can have the eye visual, um, sometimes they do like scintillation so they can see some sparks or zigzag lines, and then they can have some kind of weakness on their hand. And then from the hand, then sometimes it can jump to the mouth. And if you remember the homunculus, there's a big hand and then there's like the face, right? And the lips are really big. So it has to do with something in uh, how the, the brain, the innervation of the brain. So 
those could be the symptoms that they could be feeling. Um, each individual aura symptom lasts about five to 60 minutes. And this is very important because if it lasts more than 60 minutes, then this is, this is uh, um, a stroke as, until proven otherwise, right? At least one aura symptom is unilateral. At least one aura symptom is positive. And we'll talk about the positive and the negative. And the aura is accompanied or followed away within 16 minutes by the headache. And of course, not better accounted by another ICHD3 diagnosis. So a couple of points for those of you who are not familiar with these uh, diagnostic criteria, it's kind of got a similar feel to the DSM, right? You got a sort of a pick list of things you go down to help you make the diagnosis. I, I think the second point is for the migraines, it talks about having some constitutional symptoms of some sort, nausea, vomiting, or a couple of the choices there. So it's not just in your head, right? A, a, a headache that's just in your head uh, that would that doesn't have any symptoms at all that would argue against that being a migraine type headache, right? Yep. Okay, and these are the R symptoms that are fully reversible. I was just talking a little bit about that, the positive features, the flashing lights, the zigzags, the spark or blank spots. Uh, they can appear on one side or centrally. They can expand and move across the field of vision or they can also have negative features like loss of vision or hemianopsia, which I think is, is very scary, right? Um, the sensory symptoms are the pins and needles, tingling or numbness, weakness or a spinning sensation or vertigo. Uh, the less common ones are dysphasic speech disturbances, but they can present like that too. Okay, and chronic migraine. So this is basically just to have the diagnosis that it's, we probably need to start thinking about how are we gonna treat this chronic migraine, right? So 15 or more days in a month, for more than three months, which at least eight days in a month has the features of a migraine headache. Um, let's remember also that people can have both migraine or tension type headache. So to fulfill this diagnosis of chronic migraine, it has to be the migraine, features of the migraine headache. Okay, and this is a different type of migraine, is a typical aura without headache. So we talk about the migraine without the, head, without the aura, the migraine with the aura, and this is the aura without the headache. So this is the criteria is no headache accompanies or follows the aura within 60 minutes. And this also, it's very, very important that we need to investigate for a transient ischemic attack, right? Because it, if it's more than 60 minutes of the weakness, then we don't know if this is contributed to the typical aura without the headache or to yeah, um, transient ischemic attack. Uh, when symptoms are exclusively negative, that's when we also need to uh, investigate and when the aura is prolonged or very short. So, so this is not that common, but it's not super rare either. You will see this uh, during your career, I would, I would guess. Um, somebody will have the, the, the aura and, it's, and then not the headache. It's pretty, it's much easier if it's a more classic type of aura, like if they've got the visual symptoms with the scintillations like people get and they don't get a headache, that's much more clear but as Priscilla has alluded to several times, you can get an aura is a neurologic symptom and it could be a variety of neurologic symptoms, um, uh, including uh, uh, symptoms in the limbs, symptoms in the abdomen. So if they've got an, a, an uncommon aura and no headache, that can be exceedingly difficult, nearly impossible to sort out. So uh, that, that is a phenomenon that's pretty well described and it's not that rare. Thank you, Dr. Nato. Okay, the, another different type of migraine is the migraine with brainstem aura. That was previously thought to be a vascular event, but 
it's a neurological event. So it was before it was called uh, vascular artery migraine or related to the, the vascular. So they changed it to brainstem aura, which is uh, a better name, I think. So for the criteria is attacks that are fulfilled the criteria for the migraine with the aura and the criteria B. So the aura with both of the following, no motor or retinal symptoms, and at least two of the following fully reversible brain symptoms. Uh, they can have dysartria, vertigo, tinnitus, hypoacusis, which they can lose hearing on one ear, uh, diplopia, ataxia, that is not attributed to a sensory deficit or decreased level of consciousness. So this is pretty scary, right? I mean, if we have a 15 year old with uh, any of these symptoms, we're gonna think there's something, of course, something neurological happening and we'll have to do the whole workup first. Um, and the fact that no motor or retinal symptoms are excluded in this diagnosis is because there is other kinds of migraines like hemiplegic migraine or retinal migraine that I think those were really, really rare. So I'm not gonna touch on those, but just for you to know, there is very specific uh, criteria on those types of migraines. And, and just to keep in mind, it's it's although the, the most common auras are the, are or what, what you'll usually see, it can be just a huge variety of different neurologic symptoms for the aura. Yeah. Okay, our case report, continue with the case report, question number two. So Annie, our 21 year old female with a migraine without the aura, presents to the ER for one day of continuous severe headache, nine out of 10 that is unresponsive to analgesics with right-sided hemiplegia and facial drooping since about two hours ago. The examination reveals upper motor neuron type right facial nerve palsy with slurred speech, but preserved comprehension. Motor examination shows mild hemiparesis of the upper motor neuron type and this episode was not preceded by fever, arthritis, head trauma, syncope or seizure. So what is the next best step? Start trip tense, do a CT of the head, do a lumbar puncture, do an echocardiogram or do an MRI. And if somebody can help me with the chat because I cannot see it, I don't know why. I have one answer for B so far. Okay. Anybody else? Anybody? <laughs> I won't know who answers, guys. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, eventually we'll, we'll end up doing the CT of the head, the lumbar puncture, the echo, and the MRI, right? So the main point for this question was that in this type of patients, triptons are not the best option. Uh, triptons, triptons tend to uh, do the vasoconstriction and they can worsen any of these symptoms. So it's contraindicated when we have an, any motor or neurological symptom. Um, the CT head is gonna help us rule out any um, mass or any bleeding. Lumbar puncture is gonna help us rule out also subarachnoid hemorrhage, hemorrhage or um, meningitis. Uh, echocardiogram is going to help us rule out for um, something in the heart, a uh, fra um, ovale, patent foramen ovale that can th throw a clot and cause this um, stroke-like symptoms. And of course, the MRI is going to be the most important here. And according to the neurology guidelines, they, the one that's the best one is the MRI with the X. Um, uh, the axial, 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 fa fast axial, because that one has different types of uh, cuts and the way that the MRI is going to deliver is going to be completely, um, you, you were gonna be, you're gonna be able to see the stroke basically. Oh, I think the, the summary, just, just if you guys go back one, the, the summary points are the person with a, 
who has a persistent neurologic finding, you're seeing drooping, you're not going to start the trip dance. The person answered B, I think that is the next step, because if you're in the ER, you've got a persistent neurologic finding, uh, scan time on a CT is much faster than the MRI, so that's going to likely be done first. So I would think that's the correct answer. And then the point about the MRI is if you're in a less acute situation where you want to um, do an evaluation and you want some imaging for migraine headaches, the MRI is often better because you can see uh, smaller uh, lesions than you could just with the, the CT and the ER. And this is our patient's MRI showing the infarct in the left temporal, <laughs> temporal parietal and basal ganglia region. And this is pretty rare. Um, Dr. Nato agrees that it's very, very extremely rare. Um, I did saw a case in the emergency in the VA that patient with aura, with migraine, with aura had a, a very, very small stroke, but he, he did. So for these patients, um, these are complications of migraine, right? So the status migraineosus, persistent aura without the infarction, migraineous infarction, and the migraine aura triggered seizure. So in, in our patient, oh, never mind, that's another question. So the status uh, migraineosus, so this is also that in the ICHD3, they have this criteria for the complications. Uh, for the status migraineosus is a debilitating migraine attack lasting for more than 72 hours. The diagnostic criteria will be a headache attack fulfilling criteria B and C, so occurring in a patient with migraine without aura and or migraine with aura, and the typical of previous attacks except for the duration, right? So more than 72 hours. Both of the following characteristics, um, more than 72 hours, pain and or associated symptoms are debilitating and they're not better accounted by any other ICHD3 diagnosis. Um, and I, I know when we diagnose a patient with aura, the criteria, I don't know if anybody has put in, like when you put the diagnosis in EPIC and it shows here, oh, migraine without aura, with the aura and intractable or tractable, so this could be, uh, if it's a status migraineosus, it could be a specific complication that has its own ICD code and everything. Uh, persistent aura without infarct. So this is, this is the aura symptoms that are persisting for more than a week or more without the evidence of an infarction on the neuroimaging. Right, so nothing on the uh, MRI, but they still have these symptoms. Micronose uh, infarction is a, uh, another type of complication. So this is a migraine that is occurring in a patient migraine with the aura and typical of previous attacks, except that this one, uh, the aura symptoms persist for more than 60 minutes. Neuroimaging does demonstrate the ischemic infarction in the relevant area that the patient is having the symptoms. And of course, not better accounted by other ICHD3 diagnosis. Uh, lastly, this is our migraine aura trigger seizure. So this is uh, occurring in a patient with migraine with aura and during or within one hour after the attack, they have, um, the, the seizure. And our case report, question yeah. number three. This is our before, last question. Before we go to the question, the, 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 uh, so I think it's super interesting. Uh, the, the, the people that have a post, -neuro, uh, a post headache or a post aura uh, neurologic sequelae is, is just interesting because the pathophysiology of migraines is you know, really felt to be a neurologic phenomenon, not a vascular phenomenon. The vascular changes are probably secondary to the neurologic changes rather than the other way around, yet somehow some of these things persist. If you take a look at the average migraine, there's not like a measurable decrease in blood flow, even though there may be some changes in the, uh, in the, in, in the uh, tone on the, the blood vessels. So, 
you know, why does a small number of people end up getting a neurologic event afterwards? So I don't think that's well understood, um, but, but it is it is super interesting. I don't think you need to be too super scared about migraine because most, because it's not that common again. Uh, migraine neurologic events, but just but you should be aware that that is a, a, a possibility. It does happen. Okay, in our case report question number three. So, what migraine complication did our patient have? A status migrainosus, persistent aura without infarction, migrainous infarction, or migraine aura trigger seizure. No answers. Nobody's brave enough to put anything in the chat. Uh, nobody? <laughs> no. We got a C. A D. Okay. Well, a D? Two C's and a D. Okay. So if you remember migranose infarction, and I'm going to go back to the migranose infarction criteria, this is occurring in a patient migraine with aura our patient did not have an aura so you guys are okay if you didn't answer anything because this is still something that's to be determined um this was actually a case report that was written by a doctor uh Milhout. so he had a survey done with 3500 patients with ischemic strokes and found that strokes are to be more common during attacks of migraine without the aura. And this is what he proposed. So there is excessive sympathetic nervous system activation from prolonged severe pain. So there's a lot of cytokines and a lot of release of um, hormones that they result in the arterial vasoconstriction. And like Dr. Nato said, this the aura has no, or the migraine has no, has been proven that there's no vascular um, pathophysiology. But when we talk about strokes, they think there could be something related to the vasoconstriction with the sympathetic nervous system. So I think it makes more sense that it's related to something, uh, activation of the clotting cascade, at least uh, that would explain why there's, I mean, there's not a decrease in blood flow particularly, not enough to, to cause a stroke um, so it's something else. And I think microemboli or something is, is more plausible than related. Yeah, so this excessive sympathetic nervous system activation can, uh, well, it, it's hypothesized that it's arterial vasoconstriction or activation of the coagulation cascade. And the posterior circulation of the brain is very sensitive to, to this sympathetic um, activation. So that's just one uh, hypothesis. Again, our patient did have the posterior um, va uh, vasculature affected. So we think that there needs to be revision of the ICD uh, for the, for the migraines infarction to see if there is maybe people with without the aura can also get this. I mean, it's it's been multiple cases. So maybe they are gonna revise it, maybe the next one. Okay, so these are just red flag uh, headache symptoms that will be indicated to do a neuroimaging. Um, and most of us really know all this stuff, but it's just you know something extra that I wanted to put in here. Uh, so any change in established headache pattern, like the worst headache ever, or neurological signs or seizures, or a new onset after 50 years, this will be more concerned or more, yeah, more concerned for like a mass or two more. Uh, persistent headache after Valsalva maneuver or exertion, also progressively increasing in severity. Um, symptoms like systemic disorders, fever, hypertension, uh, the thunderclap headache, maximum severe headache, and the migraine with our last 60 minutes, of course, those will all indi be indicated to do a neuroimaging. I wanted to make a point about the age. So migraine onset, is it's a disease of young people, right? 
So age of onset is tends to be late teens, early twenties, right? So if you've got a 50 year old with new mic with what seems like a migraine headache for the first time, that's not common, right? So uh, you'd be much more likely to uh, to worry about some more worrisome diagnosis like a tumor, new onset headache at age 55, say, mm -hmm. say somebody who's 18 and has a classic uh, migraine history. The, the, that person would not necessarily need imaging, whereas a 50-year-old would likely get imaged, at least if they saw me. Okay, and then we're just going to touch a little bit on first-line treatment. First line treatments, uh, there is in Dr. Torres will be talking about treatments extensively, and her presentation is amazing. Uh, very, very good for uh, family medicine uh, doctors to know. So this is a treatment for mild to moderate attacks. And this has level of evidence A. This is from a family medicine, uh, the AFP article, and it's in the box that Dr. Nato likes, and it's all A's. <laughs> so Tylenol one gram, NSAIDs, aspirin one gram, that's the effective, effective dose, but there is more high risk for adverse effects. So that's why we don't use it that much. But diclofenac, ibuprofen, and naproxen, they're very good. Naproxen has a lower onset, but a longer half-life. So it's really good for, for the long acting. Uh, for, all, for moderate to severe attacks, that's where the triptums come in. So this is level of evidence A as well. Uh, the most studied and known is a sumatriptan or imitrex. It comes in oral, intranasal, or subcutaneous injections. Um, and it's pretty cool because remember when people are having the headaches, they have, they're nauseated, they, they're vomiting, they cannot take a pill. So having an intranasal or subcutaneous injection some, for some people is a life saving, right? Um, there's other ones uh, that eletriptan is it has the least cardiovascular risk because let's remember that triptans uh, can cause vasoconstriction. So you, they won't be the best medications for a patient with cardiovascular disease. Uh, Fovart triptan is for menstrual migraines, which are also described in the headache uh, classification. The solmotriptan is also really good because it also has the oral and in the intranasal. And the first line, there's also combined regimens. These are pretty cool. I really like them. Uh, the sumatriptan with a naproxen or the acetaminophen aspirin with caffeine, which is, I think most of, a lot of patients, they take this even if they don't have a migraine. Uh, but this will be the preferred one in patients with contraindications for vasoconstrictors. Second line options. So this is basically more um, symptomatic, like the anti uh, Antiemetics like chlorpromazine, droperidol, metoclopramide, um, the dehydroergotamine or ketorolac because it's injected. It works as a second line. These are things that if we have them in the clinic, you know, if a patient has a, the headache there, the migraine there, we can give them IV or IM as a second line. And these are the novel migraine treatments. Uh, the calcitonin gene related peptide antagonist. So basically they're blocking vasodilation. Um, they did uh, multiple studies on other peptides that were released during the migraines and they were doing medications for these other ones but they didn't make the headache better. So when they were trying these ones and the first one uh, well, this one, for example, was approved in 2018. <clears throat> They're pretty novel, right? And they sometimes, some people say they work, some people say they don't. So it will be very patient uh, specific, right? For the acute tr treatment of migraines, they have the Remegepant or the Ubrogepant. And the immune therapy, the monoclonal antibodies are mainly for prophylaxis. So the, all of this, eptinesumab, erenumab, 
the frenamesumab and the galcanesumab. And I think the erenumab is really cool because this is a monthly injection. So, you know, if a patient has migraines very, com very constantly, this could be one of the treatments or there's other prophylactic treatments um, like the propanolol, right? Before we leave therapeutics, if you go back sure. one, to, to make the, the point about the, to go back to the point about diagnosis, I mean, you know, the primary, uh, migraine's a primary headache, tension's a primary headache. I mean, what difference does it make if you sort it out? And the reason is therapeutics, right? If you think they have migraines, uh, the treatments outlined here uh, have been shown to work better in, in patients with that, um, with that syndrome as opposed to say the tension headache syndrome. Like for instance, the tryptans will have a, have been shown to have a, build a better effect in people with a migraine type syndrome than with tension headaches, right? So, so that's why one of the reasons why it's important. And, and just to keep in mind with the diagnosis, I mean, it's pretty much all history, right? It's stuff they tell you. So yeah, you go through that list of questions and that helps you settle on, you know, you believe in your heart that that's migraines and then that's when you're, you commit to, to this kind of, this level of therapeutics, you know, based on that. And I think by properly, properly categorizing folks, you'll be much in a much better position to uh, have success treating them. Okay, and these are the best practices in neurology. Um, this is from the Choosing Wisely campaign and the American Academy of Neurology and the American Aca uh, Headache Society. They recommend not to use opioids or butalbital for migraine except as last resort, right? I think that's fair. I mean, because this is a chronic pain syndrome, right? So. And I think uh, we have experience with use of opioids and chronic pain, and that's not, not really a great strategy because they tend to, tend to be a long-term use and a long-term strategy. So I think it's important to keep that in mind. As, and, and just to make the point about you know, chronic pain in general, I think it you know, frustrates uh, some people, but um, I'd really encourage you to, um, you know, when you're dealing with migraines, although it's a chronic pain syndrome, it's it's different. I mean, most patients who if they really have migraines, you can make most patients significantly better, less frequent headaches, less severe headaches. So um, it's actually very rewarding to treat um, as a diagnosis if you can, if you can uh, yes. embrace these strategies. Yes, it is very rewarding. I had a patient and she's very happy. <laughs> So this is a board review question, and this is from uh, the AFP quiz that they have in the, in the webpage. So which of the following conditions presents an unacceptable health risk, risk for combined oral contraceptive use? And of course, everybody's gonna say A, right? So migraine with aura. And I think this is very important because we're family medicine. Uh, we do contraception all the time but I don't know how good we address migraine with aura when, when we're before prescribing contraception. So women more than 35 years old who have migraine without aura, uh, with, sorry, with aura, they are at higher risk of having a stroke. Uh, so they don't recommend oral contraceptives with estrogen. Uh, women less than 35, years old with, who have a migraine without the aura or no other risk factors of stroke may use a contraceptive pill at a low dose estrogen. So in here is like the risk versus the benefit, right? Do you want this patient to have, um, you know, they, they're okay with the contraception, the pill, um, they don't wanna get pregnant, but they have the migraines, so, it's a risk versus a benefit. So if you're gonna use it, this is from the ACOG. Um, they said less than 50 micrograms of estrogen, but the World Health Organization says less than 35 micrograms. So if you're gonna use it, the frequency and the severity of the migraines should be monitored. And this is very important. I had a patient, she was 
in her 40s and she had cervical cancer and she was treated for um, early menopause because she had a uh, ophorectomy and everything. So she was treated with estrogens and she had migraines with aura and nobody had asked her if she, what kind of aura did she had and her description was she was just having those lights. So after we took her off of those and then we started the propanolol, she was completely free of migraines. She will have like maybe one headache that will last one hour, maybe once a month versus having a headache every single day lasting for more than eight hours. So this was a completely change in her life. She was so more happy, able to take care of her family, able to Is it just me frozen or is it? Can you hear me? Because I'm, uh, I'm frozen. I think it's just Priscilla. I can yeah. hear you guys, but everybody, everything else is frozen. Same. All right. Well, I'll wait for Priscilla to come back. I, I think it's an interesting point of speculation if you think that the complication of migraines is related somehow to the coagulation cascade, then the idea that um, hormones have some on that would be uh is just an interesting it's an interesting point um and a, and a cause for concern we'll see if she comes back on here all right while we're waiting for her to come back on i'll uh um just uh, just talk briefly I, she'll bring the link up and it'll we can send the link but um the uh there, if you if you go to Google and Google migraine art, I think it's actually kind of fun. Um, if you're kind of an art type person, or if you're just unfamiliar with the suffering that patients have with migraine, I never had a migraine. Uh, some of this is depicted rather with a lot of feeling and and uh, many many uh, artistic renditions of migraine headaches. Um, I've done versions of this talk in the past where I had permission to use some of those frames. Uh, but we did not have that for this talk. So um, since this is gonna be an enduring material, we didn't uh, add any of those, but I think uh, they're, those are interesting to look at and kind of fun and, and capture a lot of energy related to, to the headaches themselves. So I would recommend that to you. Uh, we've got some references on that. And um, are we still without Priscilla? Yeah, I'm still waiting. Uh, I just texted her, but I did want to let everybody know that I did put the link in there, the ICHD3 link. Um, it's in the chat box there. I know she had mentioned that in the beginning of the presentation. So that is there in the chat box if anybody is interested in taking a look at that. So to summarize the main points, let's say uh, we described the international uh, classification of headache uh, disorders. Um, I'd recommend looking through that. I'd recommend using, if you're gonna make diagnosis of uh, some of these headache syndromes, especially helpful, um, I think for the mi for migraines. Um, and um, I would urge you that if you have a new patient uh, who comes in with a diagnosis of migraine headaches that go through some of that to really uh, convince yourself that um, that is indeed the current diagnosis, because I think that helps you in the long run to manage the patient uh, better. And so I, I highly encourage that going through those questions again. Priscilla, I was just going through the summary of main points. I've already talked about that headache art. So sorry we lost you. Welcome back. Thank you. I don't know what happened with the connection, but so it was done at the last the contraception. So Finish your points about the contraception. I, I was not exactly sure what po additional points you made. I just made the point that uh, the hormones can affect coagulation, which may be one reason why um, the, the, this calculates that uh, the coagulation cascades related to complications of migraine. Yeah, basically, in a patient without the aura, will be 
risk versus benefit, you can consider, but if a patient has migraine with aura, then the risk is very high and they should never be used um, because of the risk of the stroke. That was my point. And in the last, second to the last uh, slide was, if you're gonna use it, then a lower dose of the estrogens will be indicated either 50 micrograms or 35 micrograms, depending on what guidelines you want to use. So I said, I talked about the migraine art and I think uh, Nicole put the link into the chat for me to sort of just reason through that. And then I think, I want you to show them your, your references there. Yeah, so I'm logging to my phone. So I'm just gonna do this um, super quick. Oh. Oh, well, maybe we could. Uh... I don't know how to change my screen. Uh, any questions? <laughs> Anybody have any questions? Nicole, can we send out the references since we don't yeah. want to? Thank I you. may actually be able to pull them up as well. All right. Oh, thank you. Let's see. So while she's doing that, if there's any, are there any questions? We'd be happy to field that. Let's see, there are the list of references. There's actually two slides with references. Hey, this is Rose Ramos. I had a question. Sure. Oh, sure. hi. Yeah, you know, I have a pharmacy student who was uh, sharing with me that migraines um, increase the risk of, or are seen more frequently in MS patients or are associated with, I couldn't remember if it was the onset of MS or the severity of symptoms of MS, with MS, associated with MS. I suspect pain, the chronic pain in M, that suffered, that MS sufferers incur regularly. Um, what are your thoughts on that? It's kind of a new thing to me. Yeah, what, what I read, uh, there is some gene components to have migraines. So I didn't find anything about uh, chronic diseases like the this one, but there is some gene components. So, so if basically, I mean, if they had that and it's it's hereditary, so, so if the mother had it, then the the people, the, the children might have it too, but I don't know about those um, chronic diseases. Yeah, I've read a fair amount over the years about, about migraine. I've not specifically seen that correlation. It doesn't surprise me that if you've got, you know, one you know, primary neurologic problem like MS and that you'd be more likely to have another neurologic process like migraines, which, which is, I think, the pathophysiology of that, but, but I, that, so it makes sense, but I don't have anything to, you know, to say that I've read that that's exactly true, or that I know that to be supported in the literature. Okay, thank you. Great question. Other questions? Well, thanks for your attention. I hope this helps a little bit. Thank you, everybody. I will send out those references um, in an email a little bit later today. Um, I'll send those out to everybody. And if anybody has any other questions, please feel free to email any of us. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.